This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a horror film called The House That Jack Built. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Jack wades through the water in the dark with his companion, Verge. Jack asks if they're allowed to converse, and Verge agrees to hear his story. Jack tells him about his experiences, dividing them into five incidents in the past 12 years. The first incident occurs when Jack is stopped by a woman who needs help with a flat tire. Her tire jack is broken, so Jack suggests getting it fixed at Sonny's repair shop. The assertive woman asks Jack for a ride to the shop, so Jack reluctantly takes her there. On the way, the woman mumbles that she made a mistake getting in the van because Jack could have been a serial killer. The woman apologizes for the remark, but she starts describing the horrible things Jack could do to her. The lady surmises that she could defend herself by hitting him in the head with the broken tire jack. At Sonny's shop, the lady persuades Jack to wait and drive her back to the car because she doesn't want to ride with another stranger. Upon reaching the woman's car, Jack tries fixing the flat tire, but the nut breaks again. Jack is exasperated with the woman's prattling, so he tells her that he needs to get to an appointment. However, the persistent woman begs him to drive her to Sunny's shop one last time, so Jack grudgingly does. Along the way, the woman exclaims that Jack can't be a serial killer, because he's too much of a wimp. Infuriated, he stops the van and hits the woman in the head with the tire jack. In his twisted mind, Jack compares the murder to great works of art, like the architecture of old Gothic cathedrals. Jack dreamed of becoming an architect, but he became an engineer because his mother thought it would be more lucrative. Before he murdered the lady, he bought a lot where he planned to build his house. Verge surmises that Jack must be suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. Because of his drive to build the house independently, Jack confesses that he had a compulsion to keep everything clean when he was a child but laments that he couldn't maintain the same standard in the walk-in freezer he bought on Prospect Avenue. Upon reaching the building, Jack parks beside the door and drags a woman's body inside the nearby empty freezer. Being the owner of the freezer, Jack is frustrated at another room that he can't open. The police surprisingly never visited him. The woman's car is still visible from the main road, but the police couldn't investigate because it's beyond their jurisdiction. In the second incident, Jack follows a widowed woman named Claire from the supermarket and knocks on her door. Jack pretends to be an insurance agent who could double her pension. Excited by the prospect of receiving more money, Claire lets Jack in. Claire walks towards the kitchen to prepare tea, but Jack grabs her and strangles her until she falls. When she tries to get up, he chokes her again and stabs her in the chest. Jack puts Claire's body on a chair and takes a photo. Then, Jack wraps up Claire's body and secures it with a rope before dragging it to his van. He cleans up the floor inside the house before leaving, but his OCD strikes, prompting him to check the house several times for traces of blood, even as he hears police sirens nearby. By the time he gets out, a policeman arrives to check on the house across the street. Worried that the cop might check his van, Jack pulls Claire's body out and hides it in their backyard. The cop approaches him and checks the back of the vehicle. Upon seeing nothing suspicious, the officer shares that there was a minor break-in nearby. Jack tells the cop that he's got a bigger problem, because Claire has disappeared. As the cops look for Claire in the house, Jack goes inside to check for bloodstains. After being told to leave the house, Jack ties the rope on Claire's corpse to his van and drives off, dragging the body on the streets. Jack drives back to Prospect Avenue, leaving a trail of blood on the road. Upon his arrival, rain starts pouring, washing away the blood trail he left behind. Jack is not a man of faith but he thinks the rain is a sign that there's a higher power protecting him. Jack acknowledges that he's a psychopath. He went to great lengths to fit into society by faking empathy. He learns to show emotions by imitating pictures of people with different facial expressions. Verge wonders if Jack was disappointed that the blood trail was washed away, ruining any chance of the police catching him. Instead, Jack was amazed, thinking that he was never punished for any terrible thing that he's done. As a child, Jack enjoyed watching the farmers cutting the meadows in unison. He believed that the meadow had lived to its fullest. After the farmers finished their work, young Jack grabs a duckling from the river and cuts a foot before releasing it back into the water. Soon, Jack finds another victim. After kissing the unsuspecting woman, he strangles her until she's out of breath. Since committing murders, Jack's OCD has been declining, and he's been taking greater risks. When he's not satisfied with the picture he's taken, he decides to return the woman's body to her apartment. On the way, Jack feels an urge to kill an elderly woman walking on the side of the road, so he runs her over with his van. He notes that his decision has put him in a more dangerous situation, forcing him to hide two dead bodies in the back of his vehicle. Verge believes that he's becoming more reckless for someone who doesn't want to get caught. Upon reaching the woman's apartment, he carries the body to the apartment to take some pictures. He's pleased that the old lady provided the photos with a touch of humor. He sends one of the photos to the local newspaper, signing it, Mr. Sophistication. 
Learning that Jack feels no remorse for the murders, Burge asks if he's ever felt the need to raise a family. Jack never did, but the concept reminded him of what he considered one of his greatest works. In the third incident, Jack invites a single mother and her two sons, Grumpy and George, to a hunting trip. Upon arriving at a forest clearing site, he shows George a rifle and a shotgun, but Jack tells him that they're not using it for hunting because he finds hunting distasteful. While the mother prepares for a picnic, Jack takes George to a tower to demonstrate using a rifle by shooting at stationary targets. Jack tells Verge that the mother and her two sons are like a mother deer and fawns. Jack points out that hunters must consider the order when they hunt them down. Hunters usually shoot the smallest fawn first because the older animals can survive without it. When they shoot the mother and fail to kill the others, the fawns are unlikely to survive. After the smallest fawn, hunters will then target the bigger fawn before killing the mother. The mother and her sons hide from Jack, who has begun hunting them. When he sees Grumpy running in the field, Jack shoots him in the leg and the back. The frantic mother runs towards her son, leaving George behind. Soon, Jack sees George peeking, so Jack shoots him in the head, prompting the mother to cry louder. Later on, Jack positions the two boys' corpses on the picnic mat and forces the mother to feed them. When Jack asks the mother her favorite number, she reluctantly says 12. Jack heads to the wooden tower and starts counting from one. The woman, who has seemingly lost her will to live, unenthusiastically walks around searching for a place to hide. Upon reaching 12, Jack shoots the woman but fails to kill her. He climbs down from the tower and shoots her in the back when he finds her in a ditch. As they go further on their journey, Jack starts to feel sick. Burge explains that it's because of the acid in their surroundings, so he advises him to get used to it. After taking Grumpy to the walk-in freezer, Jack places the corpse in the anteroom and leaves it until his body goes through rigor mortis. Upon Jack's return, he inserts wires into the corpse to manipulate the body and face to make it wave and smile. The fourth incident takes place in the apartment of a woman named Jacqueline, who thinks that Jack is disabled. He has been using a crutch since he introduced himself to make him look harmless. When he visits her one night, she tearfully refuses to talk to him because she doesn't like how he looks at her. To avoid being seen, Jack goes to another room and uses a phone to communicate with her. Jacqueline expresses her fears that he will suddenly leave her. Jacqueline smiles after Jack promises not to abandon her. After drinking, Jack starts speaking cruelly to Jacqueline, referring to her as simple, implying that she's stupid. Jacqueline tries to change the topic and asks what Jack does for a living. Due to his intoxication, Jack confidently admits that he's a serial killer who has murdered 60 people. Jacqueline refuses to believe him, but she starts believing it after Jack draws lines on her chest. Jacqueline runs outside to tell a policeman about Jack's confession. The cop, however, dismisses her, thinking that she's just drunk. Jack follows her and admits to the policeman that he's a serial killer, but the officer ignores him and advises them to stop drinking. After the officer leaves, Jack apologizes to Jacqueline who forgives him and takes him back to her apartment. When Jack passes out on the couch, Jacqueline calls her friend to score some pills, but the phone line's been cut. She tries to go outside, but the door is locked from the inside. When she turns around, she sees Jack, wide awake, holding onto her keys. Jacqueline notices that Jack is walking without his crutch and surmises that he must be Mr. Sophistication. Confident that no one would pay attention to her, Jack encourages Jacqueline to scream for help. Jacqueline screams as loud as she can, but no one responds. After Jacqueline stopped screaming, Jack tied her up with a telephone cord and gagged her mouth. He then cut up her breasts along the lines that he drew earlier. After leaving Jacqueline's apartment, he places one of Jacqueline's breasts on the windshield of a police car. Burge notices Jack only talks about the unintelligent women he killed, wondering if he feels superior to women and is turned on when he's murdering them. Jack denies this, but admits that Mr. Sophistication finds killing women easier because they're more cooperative. Jack surmises that Verge must be scoffing at Mr. Sophistication's mindset, so he expresses disdain over diagnosis that can be written down in letters. Verge argues that the letters introduce religion to humans and set the boundaries between good and evil. Jack, however, believes that religion ruined human beings because they teach people to deny their nature. Verge hints that Jack wouldn't have turned out as a murderer if he had read the right letters in his life. Jack notes that the dead bodies in his walk-in freezer must have reached some degree of petrification before he was able to freeze them. To him, decomposition is neither good nor evil because it's a natural process. Verge thinks that Jack is reducing all life to matter, consequently destroying the concept of art, which Jack values highly. But Jack contends that he only wants to set art free while Verge is killing art by imposing his moral ruler on life. To illustrate his point, he compares human decomposition to methods of winemaking. For Jack, the decomposition of grapes lifts them to become an art form, and the dead bodies are no different. Verge strongly rejects Jack's reasoning, arguing that art cannot exist without love. 
He contends that decay cannot be considered a path to salvation, noting that even Jack didn't find the destruction of his first house satisfying. Jack admits that he wasn't happy about tearing down the house three more times. He finds it difficult to build a house because the materials he's using wouldn't accomplish what he wants. Verge asserts that Jack's great talent can only take him so far and sarcastically labels him the artist of all times. Jack, however, points out that Verge planned the destruction of his most famous literary work while he was still writing it. Verge wanted to destroy the Aenide because he ended up glorifying the ruling power and its ideas to the point that it was no longer an art. Jack argues that if glorification can demean a work of art, destruction and demolition could do the opposite. Jack points to the Third Reich architect Albert Speer, who came up with the concept of ruin value after inspecting the ruins of ancient Roman and Greek structures. His buildings were constructed with weaker and stronger materials so their ruins would look pleasing after a thousand years. However, Spears' buildings were destroyed just a few years after being created. As their conversation moves along, Jack expresses his admiration for the German dive bomber called the Stuka. Jack notes that sirens were attached to the plane's undercarriage to strike fear into the hearts of anyone who hears the plane approaching. Jack thinks of the inventors of the plane as icon creators. People are disinclined to give credit to icon creators just as they're disinclined to acknowledge the beauty of decay. He laments that society deems such icon creators as the ultimate evil, but for Jack, the icons they created are extravagant art. Verge stops his explanation, saying he has never escorted anyone as vile as Jack. Verge expounds his attitude towards art and love by pointing to an old oak tree in Buchenwald concentration camp. The oak tree is where the poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote one of his most important works. Ironically, one of the most atrocious crimes against humanity was committed at the same place where the masterpieces representing human dignity and goodness were created. Jack notes that he always thought of having a favorite serial killer's trophy was ridiculous. However, he kept one of Jacqueline's breasts. He had it sewn into a wallet, thinking of it as an icon. Jack doesn't make any effort to hide the grotesque wallet when he takes some cash out of it to pay for a box of ammunition. In the fifth incident, Jack kidnaps six men and takes them into the freezer alive. He ties them up and aligns their heads in a single row to kill them with one full metal jacket bullet. As he loads the bullet into the rifle, the last man he abducted points out that Jack is not loading a full metal jacket bullet. Realizing that the man is right, Jack leaves the freezer and returns to the store where he bought the ammunition. He berates Al, the store clerk, for mislabeling the box and asks for a replacement. However, Al asks him to produce a receipt and ID, so Jack leaves. As soon as he gets out, Al makes a call. Jack visits his friend, SP. Before he could reach SP's trailer, he runs his van into a ditch, so he abandons it. Upon reaching the trailer, SP points his gun at Jack, disclosing that the police suspect Jack of robbery. After SP calls the police, Jack claims that he's glad that he's the one who caught him. He considers SP as his best friend who has set him free from the compulsion to steal. While hiding a knife under the table, Jack asks SP to put his gun down, promising that he won't try to escape. SP sets his gun on the table and pours a drink for Jack. When he hands Jack the glass, Jack stabs SP in the throat. He takes a full metal jacket bullet from the cabinet, but a police car arrives before Jack can leave. Jack wears a red robe, pretending to be SP, and shoots the unsuspecting cop when he enters the trailer. Jack drives the police car back to the freezer and loads the bullet into the rifle, but he can't focus the scope, so he forces the locked door open to make some room. As he sets up the rifle, the police arrive outside the building. Jack soon makes the proper adjustments to the scope, but before pulling the trigger, he hears a voice calling him. After turning the light on, Jack sees a man sitting in the corner, introducing himself as Verge. He knows that he's been with Jack for a while, but he never noticed. Verge reminds him about the house that he wants to build. Soon, the police demand Jack to surrender. Verge encourages him to build another house and find the material he's been looking for. Jack gathers up the corpses into the room and ties them up with wires. Afterward, Jack looks at the corpses arranged into the shape of a house and turns to Verge as if he's seeking his approval. Verge goes inside, telling Jack that it's a fine house. As the police break into the freezer, Jack follows Verge into a hole on the ground. As they wade through the water in the dark, Jack asks Verge if they're allowed to converse along the way. Verge tells Jack to go ahead and tell his tale, but he doubts that Jack will tell him anything that he hasn't heard before. After descending deep into the ocean inside a bubble, Jack hears a buzzing sound. Verge reveals that the sound is the concentrated wailing of all the individuals suffering in hell, and it will become more intense as they go further. Verge leads Jack down a dark cave that seems to be made up of human bodies. After crossing the river Styx, Verge and Jack soon come across a window overlooking the Elysian fields, but they don't have access to the area. 
Jack sheds a tear as he watches the men trimming down meadows in unison. Events from his life suddenly flash through his mind, highlighting the horrible things that he's done. Verge and Jack reach a broken bridge over a pit leading to the deepest circle of hell. Verge tells him that he's supposed to go a couple circles higher, but Verge figures that Jack wants to see everything. When Jack asks where the other end of the bridge leads, Verge reveals that it will take him out of hell. Jack wonders about transversing the rock walls to get to the other side, but Verge doesn't recommend it, as many have tried and failed. However, Jack takes his chances. Before Verge could bid him farewell, Jack climbs the rock walls. In the middle of his attempt, Jack loses his footing. Without anything to step on, he soon loses his grip and falls to the deepest circle of hell. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.